Today on Earth Focus, what's behind the disappearance of America's bees? Beekeeper Tom Theobald explains, coming up on Earth Focus. If we go back to the 1940s, uh, 1950, we had about six million colonies of bees in the United States. We've lost, uh, in the past six years, we've lost somewhere between four and a half million and 12 million colonies. The winter losses that have been reported have been 30 to 35 percent, but that doesn't cover the losses that occur at other times of the year. And I was talking with a commercial beekeeper friend not long ago, and he said that the, uh, the winter figures are, are really significantly understated. He said most of the commercial beekeepers are splitting anywhere from 70 to 115 percent of their colonies. In other words, there's almost a complete turnover of that population in the course of a season, which means that in, in effect, if we have two and a half million colonies in the United States, we're losing almost all of those during the course of a season. I've seen it in my own operation. I've seen a significant decline in the number of colonies that I'm able to keep alive. And my honey crop this past season was the lowest in 36 years. Two years ago, uh, we had the lowest honey crop ever recorded since records had been kept. Before these problems began, a, a typical national honey crop would have been 250 million pounds. Two years ago, it was 160 million pounds, which was the lowest ever. Then it came up a little bit the next year. Then this past season, it was 115 million pounds. So my, my own experience reflects what's going on nationally. And it's not just national, this is global. The rule of thumb that we generally use is that uh, bees are responsible for about a third of everything that we eat. All of those plants that require pollination. There are many uh, wind pollinated commodities like corn and rice and wheat that aren't affected by the absence of pollinators, but the good stuff, the cucumbers and the melons and the strawberries and the apples and all of those things are directly dependent upon the honeybee. Globally, it's estimated that the honeybee is responsible for the pollination of about 80% of all flowering plants. And what it means to the agricultural economy is about $15 billion a year in agricultural production for the United States. I first began to see the uh, the losses in 1995 and originally the losses were attributed to a parasite called the varroa mite which appeared in this country in about 1987. I first identified it in Boulder County in 1995 and that's when these losses began and most likely those losses initially were a result of the varroa mite but as we began to come to terms with the varroa those losses not only continued, but increased. And we didn't understand at the time what was going on, but looking back, the suspicion is that these systemic pesticides were involved. Uh, the first of those, imidacloprid, was introduced, and it's my belief, based on my experience, that as we began to diminish the losses from the varroa mite, the increased usage of Im imidacloprid replace those losses. So the losses continued and continued to es escalate. Uh, the second of the systemic pesticides, clothianidin, was introduced in 2003, and the losses have been terrible ever since. The systemic pesticide, the ones that we're talking about, are a family called the neonicotinoids. They act upon the nerve receptors they interfere with the nerve receptors. The neonicotinoids are water soluble, which means that they are taken up by the vascular system of the plant and transferred to all portions of the plant so that any insect that sucks or chews on that plant is affected by that insecticide. In the case of the honeybee, 
there are three primary ways in which they can come in contact with, with that, uh, those systemic pesticides. The first is directly through pollen and or nectar, but there's a third avenue called guttation. Uh, it's droplets that are exuded by the plant, usually in the morning, typical of corn, and the bees will use the, that as a moisture source. Those are very high in systemics and can kill the bees outright. Clothianidin is very toxic to bees, and when it was first introduced, we were told that something on the order of 50,000 parts per billion would be necessary before we would see a noticeable effect. Then with experience, that was lowered to 8,000 parts per billion, then 4,000 parts per billion. What the science is showing us now is that minuscule amounts can have profound effects. A, a level as low as one tenth of a part per billion, one part per trillion, can have effect, an effect on the honeybees. And, and the modes of action are multiple. In some cases, they can kill the bees outright. In some cases, they can compromise their immune system. They can uh, compromise their navigational ability, their memory. They have many modes of action. And it's not just the bees that are affected by these. The effect that they have on the soil is to sterilize the soil of microbes and beneficial organisms and earthworms. Uh, after a few years exposure to the systemic pesticides, the soil is virtually inert. By my estimate, it's used on over 200 million acres of farmland in the United States. In addition to that, it's used extensively in urban and suburban environments for control of turf insects, uh, insects that cause problems for trees. So the, the environment has been virtually saturated with these chemicals. The bees cannot avoid them. The original studies were done with uh, imidacloprid in France. And uh, the, the reason they were done was because the French beekeepers noticed a huge uh, loss of their colonies with the introduction of imidacloprid. Remember, imidacloprid was introduced in about 1993 or 1994. France banned imidacloprid in 1999 and Germany banned clothianidin two or three years later. It's also been banned in Slovenia and in Italy. And what we saw was a rebound of the, of the bees in those countries, most dramatically in Italy. In France and Germany and Slovenia, it was only a partial ban. It was banned on certain crops, but not on others. So the bees weren't completely free of it. But in Italy, the primary vector was corn. And they found that when they banned the use of clothianidin on corn, there was an immediate recovery the following year, both in the number of colonies, the health of the colonies, and the honey production. The studies are done by the chemical industry, not by EPA. EPA uh, tells the chemical companies what sort of studies they want done the chemical companies conduct those studies. And the one that was critical to clothianidin was what's commonly referred to as the life cycle study. The life cycle study consisted of putting four colonies of bees on two and a half acres of, of crops treated, the seed treated with clothianidin. What, what is completely disregarded is the fact that a that a colony of bees will forage over several thousand acres. And I've used the, the comparison of a rancher who's concerned with his cattle getting into noxious weeds. He might plant two and a half acres of noxious weeds, put four cows on those two and a half acres, but not fence those acres. Those cows are free to roam over thousands of acres. And what sort of results do you think you'll get? Well, you know what kind of results you'll get you'll get. My 12-year-old granddaughter knows what kind of results you'll, you'll get. She called that a bogus experiment, and it was, and yet the EPA accepted that, called it scientifically sound, and they got caught.
with their hand in the cookie jar. Now they're trying to deny it, that it wasn't important. It was the key study upon which conditional registration was granted to clothianidin, and it has failed to satisfy the requirements of registration. I have a suspicion, as any reasonable person would, and that is that it returns about a billion dollars a year to the chemical industry. The chemical industry believes that it's, that it's crucial to American agriculture. That's certainly debatable, but in the opinion of myself and many others, it's clearly failed to meet the requirements of registration. Why it's still on the market is a question that the EPA has to answer. The precautionary principle is a principle that's followed in most of the European countries and most of the other countries, and it, it means that we err on the side of caution. That a chemical is not released to the market until its safety is assured. Here in the United States, it seems to be the other way around, and what the EPA and the chemical companies have done is they have turned the environment into the experiment and the people have become the guinea pigs. We're the experimental animals. The bees really are the indicator species and they're telling us something and we need to begin listening. They're just a part of what's going on here. The effects of these systemic pesticides are dramatic and global. They're persistent, they're per pernicious, and they're having a devastating effect on a wide range of the environment. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.